I think this is a real opportunity to reemphasize the importance of all visitation, not just the cherry picking visitation, the high end visitor. Those will still be important, but I think for the next, you know, 12 to 24 months, any visitation is going to be important. You guys, I have been working on something for the last six months that has been such a giant project, but I'm so proud of it. I'm excited to announce that I've just released my book. It's called Touch Points, and it's the Destination Marketer's Guide to Brand Evaluation and Enhancement. And it is a comprehensive guide for destinations to look at their brand, evaluate what you've done, and make a very clear and detailed plan of action of how to fix it. And it's Look, I'm biased, right? Because I wrote it, but I think it's so good. I think it's a great guide, and I'm really, really happy with how it turned out. And I wanted to tell you guys about it. It's available on Amazon. Search Touch Points by Adam Stoker, and you'll be able to get that book for your destination. And I think it's going to be, especially for, for anyone that is trying to look at their brand holistically, this is the book for you. So check it out. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another special episode of the Destination Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Stoker. Once again, we will be talking coronavirus today because it is the singular most important issue in our industry today, and everybody's looking for guidance and direction on how to navigate it. Uh, My guest that I have on today, I'm really excited to have him with us. We actually, a couple weeks ago, recorded, well, I shouldn't say a couple weeks ago, it was it was really right before we got into the, the thick of the coronavirus situation. And Matt and I had a great discussion. We asked him the icebreaker questions. We got great answers to those questions. Uh, we talked a lot about his company that he works for and, and the product that he works with. And great episode, great content not terribly time relevant to what we're go- we're going through right now. And so me and Matt decided that we would like to push that original episode out uh until maybe the summertime or something like that and get a little bit more time sensitive in our in our discussion today because he's a leader in the industry and wanted to get him back on the show and kind of talk us through what we're all going through here today. So my guest is Matt Clement He's from Arrivalist, and Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks, Adam. It's a uh, it's a pleasure to be back. Um, I didn't didn't expect it would be under these circumstances, but uh, but thank you for having me back, nevertheless. Absolutely. You know, we are really trying to bring the key thought leaders in the industry together on this show to provide some of the guidance that people are looking for in the destination marketing industry, and I, I think you fit right into that. So I'm I'm excited to chat with you today. Well, I appreciate that. I, I actually just uh, finished up listening to my friend, my very good friend, Josh Collins's interview, which was fantastic. Oh, yeah. I've known Josh um, nearly since the beginning of my DMO career. We we were uh, doing a, a Facebook workshop together in Austin, Texas. I think it was in 2012 or 13. Um, and so I've known him a very long time and, and, uh, he's a brilliant guy and, and it was a great interview. So it's, it's a real honor to, uh, to be following Josh and Josh's footsteps here. Yeah. You know, Josh, talk about leadership in the industry. Josh has done an incredible job of providing that. Uh, and you know, I, just yesterday I attended two webinars that were moderated by Josh and, you know, he's, he's working hard right now to, to keep everybody informed and, and help everybody through this and, yeah, it's it's great to have have him and you and you know Will Seckham. We're, we're that episode will have just launched when people hear this. So, yeah, I got some great leaders in the industry on. So, so thanks for joining us. Absolutely, my pleasure. Well, let's start with just your role at Arrivalist and how this has affected you, Arrivalist, and your partners. Sure. Well, I'm the senior vice president of marketing here at Rivalist, and uh, you know, I guess <laughs> in terms of how it's affected the role, um, I mean, first and foremost, just like everybody else, uh, you know, that that works on this side of the fence in the industry, we we typically live on airplanes and uh, yeah. at hotels and we're at conferences every week, and you know, and that just all stopped, and and so we're all trying to readjust to the new normal uh, on this side of the fence. And, uh, you know, I think what's, what's been great is to see the rise of the zoom happy hour and, 
in the ways that we've as an industry found to come together, uh, you know, webinars and Zooms and everything else that we're doing. But uh, the day to day here at Arrivalist has really been one of trying to adapt um, to the situation and trying to figure out, you know, how do we utilize the data that we have to uh, help our clients to guide them through this. And we've had experiences in the past that, you know, I, I can't say they're like this, but we've certainly worked with clients who were going through natural disasters, you know, whether it was a hurricane um, or, you know, red tide down in Florida. But I mean, obviously nothing like this. And, and so we've been, you know, I think our first instinct was, okay, how can we help our clients? And the second, you know, that was right on top of that first instinct was how can we help the industry? And, you know, it's a very symbiotic relationship that we all have, um, whether you're an agency or a vendor partner like myself or uh, a DMO or there are hotels, it, you know, it, we all need one another and, and we all depend upon one another to be healthy. So um, to that extent, we started, uh, we really expedited some work we'd been doing on a product called the Daily Travel Index. And we decided to release that as a free tool um, that launched a few weeks ago. And uh, we're already up to version two of it. And, and so a lot of the role and the things that are, are going on for me and, and the team here at Arrivalus have really been a revolved around, revolving around the index and, and trying to help folks learn how to use it and, and hopefully figure out ways to use that data to, to lead them out of this thing. Yeah, Matt, I, before we dive too far into the index, because I'm excited to walk through it, uh, I've got it open right here. But one of the things that you mentioned was your first reaction was, okay, how do we help our clients? And then, well, how do we help the industry? This is an industry where you build such I feel like I have deeper relationships in this industry than any that I've worked in in the past. And, and I just feel like you get such a, uh, beyond a business connection an emotional connection to the people that you work with and to see them struggle, uh, li like people have over the last 30 days, uh, in, in our industry, it's really hard. So I had Will Seckham on the show and Will talked about the new normal you know, that when we talk about, hey, when we come out of this thing, for us to assume that that everything's going to be, to be the same after the fact, you know, that that's just not going to happen. There's going to be a new normal. But when we do move into that new normal, people will start traveling again. And knowing when to adjust our marketing or when to relaunch or when to launch that recovery campaign it's very difficult to to know what that timing looks like, but you guys have built a tool that helps with that. So I'd love to have you walk us through this daily travel index and tell us how to use it. I know you've got some use cases ready that that are situationally, okay, here's how you would use it or why you would use it. Uh, let's do that, Matt. Do you mind walking us through that? No, happy to. And And you're totally right, by the way. I mean, this is a, a relatively small fishbowl. Uh, you know, in the, in this particular industry, especially, you know, not just within travel and tourism, but, but specifically in the DMO industry, um, you know, we're, we're all friends, uh, in a lot of ways we're family and, and I don't yeah. say that as a cliche. I mean, I, I really sincerely mean it. I know folks like Will and Josh and, and lots of folks feel that way. Um, you know, we, we all see each other just about as much as we do our families sometimes. And, <laughs> Uh, you know, it, it has been very, very painful to see what people are going through. And so I, I think that that's just the first instinct that anybody should have and, and all good people have is how do we help? Um, and, and so it's, it's really been, it's been great to see a lot of companies, not just arrivalists, but a lot of companies coming out and saying, Hey, how can we help? And here's, here's free data. Here's free information. Um, here's guidance, you know, and, and offering that to to both their clients, but to the industry as a whole. It's really been nice to see. Well, and I think you and me have a unique opportunity because we work with several destinations. And so, you know, you get to see it not just from one client's perspective, but part of the reason you can provide such great leadership is you're seeing kind of a uh, an aggregate of experiences that people are having. 
uh, and, and use the experiences you see others have to guide the others through it, if that makes sense. And, and, you know, I feel like that puts you and me in a unique position. It also gives us a unique responsibility uh, to, to look at what's happening in multiple destinations and help leverage those strategies and tactics and communications uh, that are working and, and help everybody kind of rise back up when it's time. Absolutely. Absolutely. The Daily Travel Index, uh, the, the concept was that we wanted to provide a tool within the framework of the data that we have available that could really be a daily pulse on consumer travel activity and specifically consumer travel activity within the drive market. Um, there are a lot of fantastic resources for data on things like flight searches and bookings, hotel bookings and search. I, I think what Adara has done has been really, really uh, strong. You've seen Sojourn doing similar work. Um, there have been good sentiment studies being published by, by companies like MMGY and Longwoods that are all freely available. And, and so a lot of those angles, I think, are being covered very, very well. Within the realm of geolocation data, we felt like the niche that we could help fill was looking specifically at um, not just consumer mobility, which a lot of geolocation companies have been doing that. They're, they've done a great job of illustrating what consumer mobility looks like, how the pandemic has affected that. But when you talk about consumer mobility, um, most of the time we're talking about, you know, what's the propensity of folks to get in their car and go to Starbucks or, you know, just to move around their local community. And a lot of that's been focused on, you know, showing how the stay at home orders, you know, how much compliance has there been? How much are we actually, you know, doing what we should and staying at home and, and trying to keep ourselves and others safe. But for the travel and tourism industry, we really need a, a bigger view than that. Um, we needed to, we need to show um, what is the mobility like, but on a trip basis. You know, not just people getting in their car and going to Starbucks, but but getting in their car and driving fifty miles or hundred miles. You know, essentially taking a road trip. And and so right now, of course, um, there's not a lot of good news to share on that front, right? Right. Um, we we all know where where travel currently is, but. As we launched this particular tool um, and and designed it to be focused on the drive market, and you know we we found some pretty fascinating data, uh, some you know fascinating narratives. So so the index really does it, it. It it focuses on the drive markets. The way that we do that is that we we took our data and we um, optimized it and and filtered it a bit so that we were able to look at just trips of 50 plus miles by car um, where the, the user uh, stays at least two hours in a destination. And we feel like this provides, you know, some really fascinating, again, some really fascinating narratives um, about the decline in travel. And hopefully we'll provide a leading indicator when it's finally time for all of us to put our hard hats back on and, and start redeploying our resources, getting folks to, to come to our destinations again. Got it. Got it. And I'm looking at this first, this first table here, right? And it looks like you can select the home state of the people that you want to look at, right? And, and then you can look at their distance traveled. And then you'll see what, well, whatever the, the date range is that you put in, but you can see month over month, week over week, right? And then day of the week uh, versus the week before. Does that, is that what we're looking at here? So what you have are three different metrics um, available. So you have a daily travel index. It's that first number on the left side. And that is um, looking at the uh, travel activity relative to um, the average trip volume in February of this year. Now, eventually we will uh, update this again so that it's showing year over year. We don't yet have that legacy data from last year available to compare against. So right now we're kind of comparing to, you know, what was normal before the pandemic. Um, and so that, that, uh, that number that you're seeing there, and it'll be a different number by the time uh, the listeners log on and check this out, you know, listening to us today. 
Um, but that first number relates to, you know, relative to average volume in February, you know, where are we at today? And so what it shows you is a percentage below or above that baseline. The day of week change is showing how today looks versus a week ago, same day. So it's a, uh, it's a beautiful Thursday morning here in Texas. Right now, the index um, would be showing us, you know, for instance, what today looks like versus last Thursday. And then finally, week over week change looks at the average volume for the past seven days and compares it to the seven days previous to that. Got it. Um, we don't have month over month yet, but we are looking at trying to get that added here in the near future. Okay, Matt, one of the things that you mentioned to me as we were kind of doing our our pre-show call uh, is you talked about how it's a pretty widely accepted consensus in the industry that drive markets are going to kind of lead us out of this thing. And 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 I think that's very realistic. I think it's most likely that people will start small and kind of uh, scale their travel efforts from there. It might take a couple weeks for or excuse me, a couple years for people to book that big trip that they were maybe planning for this summer. And so the reason I bring that up, I think that makes what you've put together here so much more valuable for destinations. And for example, I, my home state is in Utah, right? So if I'm, if I'm looking at my home state and saying, okay, what do those stats look like? Well, I can see that today, well, I guess I should say Tuesday versus the previous Tuesday. So we're a couple days, a couple days behind on what I'm looking at. But we're up 23% in how far people are willing to drive uh, versus last Tuesday. And then the entire week, week over week, we're up 8%. And, and to me, that is very valuable data because if that continues to climb over time, it's going to be like, okay, people are getting more comfortable. People, they're health conscious. They're, they're trying to be safe. They're probably wearing masks, you know, depending on the person, but they're willing to travel. And that's when you know, hey, it's time to start encouraging these people to do so, especially if the destination has done its part to provide a safe experience for travelers. So tell me a little bit, am, am I interpreting that data correctly? Um, and, and is that a good way to use this tool? I, I think you're interpreting it correctly. Um, when we look at the, uh, the index, especially in the chart view, you're going to see that um, one of the first really interesting things is that it's always been true um, for our data. And I think for anybody that's measuring travel activity, whether it's bookings or geolocation data, is you always see those spikes on the weekend. Um, it's always been true. Right. And, and it, of course, it would be true. What's interesting is that during the crisis, we um, are still seeing those very defined spikes on the weekend for a lot of places where even though that total volume is way, way down, um, although I have to say Utah seems to have fared a little bit better. Utah residents have remained a little bit more active. Um, than in a lot of places. Well, I think part of that's the lack of stay-at-home order in parts of the state too. I think that contributes sure. quite a bit to it. it, it it's an, and then that gets to be a really interesting discussion, right? Um, and about stay-at-home uh, orders, but but you still see that those familiar patterns, you know, kind of the EKG of of consumer travel activity, and uh, so you're you're looking at it correctly. We don't want to offer any false positives. You know, when we see uh, week over week change up 8%, again, it's important to note that we're talking about, you know, we're up 8% on the index value compared to last week. So we still... <laughs> and last week was terrible. <laughs> last week was terrible. <laughs> so, you're, you know, we, I want to be really clear with everyone that, that what we're looking at here is, you know, relative to where we've been. And, and so we still have a long way to go, but, but you're reading it correctly. And, you know, there's a couple of things here to really take into account. So first, you know, there, there's a few, few ways to get the most out of the index. And I think the first thing you have to do is to define your drive market. What, what is for your particular destination? What is your drive market? And of right now we only offer this on a statewide level. So 
if you're, um, let's just say that you're Florida or you're a destination that's in Florida, your drive market probably consists of residents of the state of Florida, Georgia, Alabama, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure the Carolinas, there's probably a pretty big white swath of the Southeast that Florida would consider its drive market and, and probably even some Northeastern states as well. So that's the first step is that I would want to look at, you know, on the right side there, when you see the home state selection, I would want to pick all the states uh, where those residents are people I consider a part of my drive market. But the other thing, and this is really kind of a pro tip, is that you want to then go and look at distance traveled. And this is really a critical step because if you're the Florida Keys and you're looking at dry market activity for Georgians, um, you've got to remember that for Georgians, it's still 200 and some odd or maybe 300 some odd miles from Georgia to Florida. So you're going to want to look at um, and make sure that you're paying attention to activity in that larger miles band, that distance travel band, uh, yeah, 200, I'm, I'm 250 actually, plus. I'm really glad you point that out because just even as I, I'm still looking at Utah, right? And so I went to distance traveled and I went 50 to 100 miles. And so at 50 to 100 miles, we're up 34.6% week over week, right? Mm-hmm. Once again, last week was terrible. So 34%, still not that much, right? But then as we look at 100 to 250 miles, we're only up 8%. And I'm on the day of the week change uh, category there. Mm-hmm. And so the the other thing that this allows you to do, uh, if, if I'm interpreting it correctly, is say, what should my marketing radius be? And you obviously have to have enough data over time. But then I look at the 250 plus miles and we're down 3.7% from a terrible week last week. And it's like, okay, People outside of 250 miles, if I was just using the data that I have today from this data tra- uh, daily travel index, I'm not marketing to these communities that are 250 miles away, right? That's right. I'm, I'm in the 50 to 100 mile radius. Um, and to me, that's a very powerful tool as a marketer to know m- what my radius should be when, you know, before this thing all started, knowing your radius was actually a really difficult thing to do, you know? Absolutely. Well, it provides the distance traveled really provides an additional layer of context. And, and I think that is really critical. Now, you know, again, if, if you're, if your destination, especially out in the Western states, where a lot of your big metropolitan areas that you're probably drawing visitation from, you know, if those places are two, 250 miles, then yeah, you, you definitely have a different set of um, things to consider. But I do also want to mention that it's funny (laughs) in in our industry, day trippers and and short range trips by car were sort of the redheaded stepchildren, right? Yes. (laughs) We we really didn't want day trippers. Uh, We could do without day trippers. And and I'm not saying that it's necessarily the revenge of the day trippers or anything like that. But they are going to be one of the really early indicators, I think, that, okay, things are going to come back to, to some sort of, of normal um, or a new normal, as, as I believe you mentioned that Will had, had put it. So even if I'm um, the Florida Keys, I would still you know, be looking at uh, Georgia, for instance, and looking at that 50 to 100 mile band to see those steady upticks. And it's, it's just kind of like the stock market. Um, you know, after a time, you know, we'll know we're out of the recession when we've had a certain number of quarters of positive growth. And it's sort of the same thing looking at the travel index. So a, a couple of suggestions is first, you know, define that market for yourself so that you know what States are important to you. Second, add additional context by really paying attention to the mileage bands that are appropriate for your destination destination relative to those drive uh, markets. If you're in the Northeast, let's say that you're a DMO in New Jersey, um, you have massive population centers all within a hundred miles of you. And you're probably historically drawing a lot of visitation from those markets. So you don't really have to worry about the 250 mile band nearly as much. Um, You know, if Pennsylvanians are not getting out, in 250 mile ranges in droves in June, 
that's okay if they are piling in their cars and driving 100 to 250 miles, which is more than within range of New Jersey. So it's just adding that context. And those are the things that you want to look at. Um, and, and it also, I think, is worth stressing that in addition to looking at the index, you really should also be utilizing all of these other fantastic free resources that are available. Um, whether, again, I think, you know, I mentioned the Adara uh, COVID-19 tracker with search and booking data. Longwoods is releasing, I believe, weekly sentiment uh, surveys that really show kind of the changing uh, mentality of, of the American traveler. MMGY, Tourism Economics, Sojourn, TripAdvisor. I mean, the list goes on and on and Crowd on. Riff. I, I love Crowd some Riff, of the resources yeah. that Crowd Riff has put out uh, in this yeah. process. There's just so many resources out there right now, and they're free. Um, so that's that's my other pro tip is make sure that you're utilizing, you know, bookmark all of those sites. And as I've always said, you know, we all, as as vendors, we all have sort of our piece of the puzzle. So gather all of those together to really complete the picture that's appropriate for your destination. I, I think that's great advice, Matt. I, I appreciate you. You know, that's a selfless call out of all the all the other resources that are out there. Um, I want to go back to one of the things that you said, because I think it was really poignant for what what's going on right now. You mentioned that, you know, the drive markets in some cases have been the redheaded stepchild of, of the industry. I feel like, and, and I, I actually, this was one of the first things that I wrote once we kind of started this, this crisis in an article that I wrote, that we have neglected our drive markets for far too long. You know, the, the industry was so good. Travel was so good that we said, you know what? We only want people that will stay for five days or more and that will spend this amount, this amount of money and started to neglect those, those drive markets. To me, your drive markets are actually, they could even be considered a stakeholder, right? Because you are the convenient destination for those drive markets. And I think that one of the one of the positives that will come out of this crisis is I think people will be much more destinations will be much more hesitant to neglect their drive markets because this will really illustrate the importance of them just like it did in 2008, 2009 when nobody was booking a long range trip and everybody was going to their drive destination, you know. I I couldn't agree more. Um and and a lot of that, you know, has was driven by the fact, and it's and it's still true, that we're funded. You know that the old heads and beds cliche, right? Right. That's that's how we were funded. That's how we were measured. And if this particular crisis has shined a light on anything, it, it's that the world that we impact as as tourism professionals, as DMOs, um, especially, is much 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 wider than just putting heads in beds. Um, the folks that we're, we're attracting to our destinations are filling up our restaurants. They're going to our museums. They're keeping our attractions alive. Attractions that not just, you know, are for the good of visitors, but are for the good of locals. And when tourism stopped, which <laughs> pretty much stopped, I believe I can almost pinpoint the date using the DTI. It was, it was uh, I think it was March 18th is the day it feels like tourism stopped. Uh, when California yeah, it's enacted. When half the Utah Jazz got the <laughs> coronavirus is what it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, I think it's when a, a California enacted their stay-at-home order, but <laughs> but we'll go with the Jazz. We'll go with the Jazz. Um, but with the di- with, on the day that tourism stopped, I think our communities, we and our communities found out that tourism impacts far, far more than perhaps we were being given credit for. Um, my wife is a, a financial analyst for the city of Fort Worth and, and they're looking at just how much of a city's budget, municipal budget is impacted by tax revenues that, you know, yes, residents are contributing to, but visitors are contributing a huge portion to, and those tax revenues that are coming in by visitors, whether they are, you know, staying for four nights in a nice hotel or they're staying for one night or just coming in for the day, all of that money ends up going into the same place. And and it's what pays for our fire trucks and it pays for our police officers 
and it pays for um, infrastructure and all the things that we need for cities to to run, you know, for civilization as we know it to continue. We play a much bigger part in that. And I think we've always known that. I think in the DMO industry, we all knew it. Um, folks like Josh and I and, and, the, and the friends that we uh, we run with, um, you know, the different little think tank groups that we all have. We've, we've been saying this for a long time. We are way bigger than just putting heads in beds, even though that's a very important part of what we do. And I think this is a real opportunity to your point to reemphasize the importance of all visitation, um, not just the cherry picking visitation that was so important to us six months ago, you know, the, the high end visitor um, the visitors that were more likely to stay for seven nights versus three nights, those will still be important. But I think for the next, you know, 12 to 24 months, any visitation is going to be important. And what's really funny, Adam, is <laughs> the kind of the, the, the dark humor joke right now is that all through the winter, a lot of us in this uh, this industry were working on sustainable tourism decks, you know, dealing with things like overcrowding. And <laughs> I can uh-huh. tell you, <laughs> those are not going to be presentations that we need for a little while. <laughs> Unfor- oh, man. Unfortunately, but but definitely not going to need them for a little while. You're going to get me on my soapbox here, Matt, and, and that that's not good. So I'm going to try to to not go too far here. But, you know, one of the things about the idea of over tourism has been the hesitation by a lot of, and and I'll pick on national parks a little bit here to build infrastructure, to support the amount of tourists that can come to a destination and the hesitance to build that infrastructure has caused a lot of that over tourism. And what I mean by that is, you know, in most of our national parks, you have one road that gets 90 to 95% of the traffic And then you have hundreds of thousands of acres that get about 5% of the traffic split between them. So dispersing that traffic is is a much higher priority than limiting the amount of traffic that comes. And, And now places that have decided, well, you know what? we get so much traffic that we don't want anymore. We, we want to stop advertising because there's too many people coming. Their brands have, have been fragmented and have suffered so much that it's going to take longer for them to recover than the destinations that instead of complaining about over tourism, focused on infrastructure and support, uh, and, and didn't stop advertising the destination. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. And, you know, like I said, I think that this is the opportunity to really change that mentality in our communities. And, 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 you know, I I hate that that opportunity comes about in such a painful way. I really do. But, but it is, it it is an opportunity for sure. And, um, you know, I think that we'll see, I, I think we'll see a huge shift in the way that DMOs are, are viewed. And I, you know, I believe Josh has spoken about this quite a bit. Uh, another friend of ours, uh, Leroy Bridges down in, in St. Pete Clearwater. Oh yeah. Has also spoke about it. He spoke, they were talking about this yesterday on that, uh, on the webinar that I, I believe you referenced earlier. Right. You know, there's been a lot of really good ideas that have come out in the last month and a half or so, the way that we're supporting local businesses, the, the way that we're promoting them on our websites, those things should not be put in the trash can when we start to see travel pick back up again, because, oh, we don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. That should really, you know, when Will talks about the new normal, in my mind, and I think in, in, in the minds of folks like Josh and Leroy and a lot of smart marketers uh, in our industry, it's the new normal is that we've, we've kind of developed these cool new strategies to support our local communities. And those now become a part of our playbooks, a permanent part of the playbook versus something that we say, okay, we don't have to do that anymore. Um, so it's a real opportunity in a lot of ways. I totally agree. You know, it's, it's funny. It's not like these businesses within these destinations suddenly became critical to the visitor experience. You know, they, they've been a critical part of the visitor experience for years and years. And hopefully the attitude of let's do everything we can to make sure they survive so that we can preserve our visitor experience doesn't go away when visitation comes back. You know, that I, I think that would be the the tragedy here is that some of the amazing proactivity that we've seen in the industry 
withers away when revenue returns. Totally, totally agree. Well, you know, Matt, we keep talking about, okay, what could it look like after the fact? What do we need to make sure we're aware of when things come back? Making sure that that some of these practices that are put in place don't don't wither away when it comes back. We keep saying when it comes back. Tell me a little bit about, in your eyes, what that recovery looks like and maybe what some of our listeners can expect. Sure. Well, I, I think first it is important to say that sitting here on Thursday, April 16th, everything is so up in the air right now. There's there's an awful lot of variables. We had the mayor of Los Angeles yesterday saying that he doesn't see how we can have large groups like concerts and sporting events until 2021. We we see optimism in other corners of the country that feel like, hey, we can get back to a, you know some level of normalcy as early as May. And, and so there's there are opinions and experts um, from all corners giving us an awful lot of, or a really wide range of opinions about when things like travel can return. But, and, and so it's very hard in this environment, which is unlike anything we've ever seen. And there are really brilliant people talking about this specific to travel and hospitality that are saying, we just don't know. Um, having said that, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to hypothesize about what we think. Um, the return will look like or when it will happen. And in our case at Arrivalist, we've spent a lot of time looking at the data um, relative to the decline. And the thing that really occurred to, to us and, and to me personally was that the, there was a day when it, it feels like there was one point in time when travel really tanked and it really stopped. And it wasn't really as much related to an increase in cases of COVID-19. It was when the state of California enacted their stay at home order. And it's really fascinating. Um, when you look at what travel looked like on the date just previous to that and what it looked like the day, the week after and every state, even in Alabama, for instance, and I call out Alabama because they're one of the states that, you know, didn't enact a stay at home order until early in early April. But even in a state like that, where, you know, they were still uh, the state residents there, the residents of the state were, you know, not restricted in their movements. At the exact same time as California, their activity tanked. It really dropped um, quite a bit. Uh, nearly just the, about the same ratio as, Calif as California residents. And you see that everywhere. You saw it in Texas. Um, and, and you guys listening can, can go to the index right now. And if you look at Texas and you select 250 mile, uh, the 250 mile band, you'll see two huge peaks uh, around the first two weeks of March. That's Texas spring break. And it's not a big secret that um, the reason you see such huge peaks in that 250 mile plus band is that we invade the state of Colorado in March. Wow. <laughs> uh, in, in droves. We, we also visit a lot of places in our own state and in other neighboring states, but a lot of people go to Colorado. And you, I think the 13th was the last week where we saw a really high level of activity. And then the very next week, which was the week that California enacted its, its stay-at-home order, it absolutely just plummeted, and it has remained pretty much at that level ever since. Um, even in the face of, of ex an exponential rise in COVID-19 cases, it was really much more tied to the stay-at-home order. Wow. I, I hit on that so hard because I think that you know, I, I was listening to a webinar uh, last week and a really smart gentleman. It was one of the Adar webinars, actually. And a very smart gentleman was talking about gating events and that he felt like there were three gates for travel to really start to come back. And one of those was a reduction in virus uh, COVID-19 cases. Two was a lifting of stay-at-home orders. And three was the return of corporate travel. I, I agree with him, but I think that in terms of priority, it seemed as though maybe he was prioritizing a drop in cases. 
whereas I would prioritize um, the lifting of the stay-at-home orders, which will probably be pretty t- tied pretty close to the number of cases in a particular state. But that's going to be a domino, and, and and I think the domino that'll have to fall will be one of the major, you know, really big populous states, whether that's Texas or Florida or California, lifting that stay-at-home. I think that the hypothesis I've I have in my hope, I mean, this is, and this is a very, just for the record, a very optimistic hypothesis is that yeah. similar in the way that we saw this huge drop off when California enacted its stay at home, we could likewise see this huge um, spike back going the other direction. Once one of the main States, one of the big States lifts that stay at home. Got it. Got it. So that that's the domino that maybe we need to all be watching for then is is in your drive markets when the stay at home order is lifted, immediately check the travel index, right, on on Arrivalist website and and use that as kind of a validation tool to say, okay, uh, it, it seems like when the order is lifted that people are going to be willing to move. Make sure the data supports that and then boom, that's when you know. I think so. And you know, it, it should be also noted that the the impact um, was fairly uniform in terms of you know there was there was definitely a, a moment in time when travel was at a you know a normal rate, and then it wasn't, and it happened over the course of pretty much a week across every single market in the United States. But if you start to look for context, you know, again, looking at mileage bands, for instance. The EKG of Washington State's residents for trips over 250 miles, that that EKG does not look the same as it does for Texas. There's more spikes and more variability. And and so I think there's a lot of factors to think about. There's there's things like politics to consider. Um, There's the, the range that people have to drive to go somewhere to think about for certain states. Um, that are all going to factor into this. So the point really is the impact is the return is probably not going to be completely uniform. I think there will be a general lifting. Um, once one of the first big states lifts its stay at home, I think other states will really quickly fall in line. But that doesn't necessarily mean that if you're, again, we'll just go back to my Florida reference, That doesn't necessarily mean that folks in your 250 mile range are also going to see that same immediate uptick. Um, It it will probably be an uneven return to normal, but totally fair, you know, but the tools are definitely out there to, to monitor that for sure. Great. I I think that's great advice and, and kind of a great trigger for, for destinations to be watching for. Uh, Matt, this has been a great conversation, and I th- <laughs> I feel like we could do this for a very long period of time, but I, I, I want to kind of wrap up the episode a little bit. I, I, I would just love if there's any takeaway or like a, a comprehensive piece of advice you could give our listeners to walk away with, what would that be? I, I would say that my my piece of advice would be to, you know, first and foremost, um, take the things that you've learned the last 45 days and don't throw those, those things away. Um, you know, the tremendous work that you're doing to support your local businesses, you know, that, that sort of refocus on, you know, taking care of local businesses. Don't let that go away. Um, let's figure out how to, um, use, you know, as we, as we look at the focus on road trippers, Uh, you know, on the drive market, day trippers, let's figure out a way to to really make them a valuable piece of our strategies going forward, because I think we're going to need them for a long time. Um, And so there's a real opportunity to recalibrate there, you know, what our messages look like. Um, And, you know, I think the other part of it is in the more immediate um, present is, and I, I think this is the third time I've said this, really utilize the free resources that are available. Um, you know, and, and, and really put that, that data to work, um, for you. There, there's a Matt, lot of, would you kill me if I gave you some homework on this? Would you be upset yeah. if I did that? No, no, not at all. 
Um, you know, we've got that Destination Marketers LinkedIn group. Would you be willing to post all the free resources that you're aware of? Um, and then we'll obviously fill in the blanks with with anything we've seen or have access to and and hopefully use that to create kind of a one stop shop where people can can find everything that's available. Oh, happy to do that for sure. Awesome. Awesome. I think that'll be really, really good for our listeners to be able to find all of the, because there's so many more resources out there than people think. Uh, so many companies like Arrivalist that are, that are really trying to leverage their skill set to, to help the industry through. So uh, great advice. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. And, you know, again, I, I think that there's a lot of resources to look at. I mean, you know, in the next, I think, 100 days, um, hopefully in the next I'd really like to say in the next 30 days to be optimistic. I think what we all need to be watching for are, you know, one, um, yes, a, a drop in cases, but really even more important than that is as we see that drop in cases, looking for the stay at, uh, the stay at home orders to be lifted. And even if you're in Florida and the first stay at home order that's lifted is in Arizona, I'm just kind of throwing that out there really watch the activity in Arizona and see how quickly it comes back and kind of take note of the speed that it comes back, even if it's not in the particular region that is pertinent to your destination, because that will be, I think, a really great way to understand um, how much time we'll, we'll go from being kind of in the, the basement where we are right now to you know some semblance of normal. And that's going to really be a great way to guide your hand on when to redeploy your resources, when to get those out there. Because part of this, and this is going to be really difficult for everyone, is figuring out when to redeploy in a way that won't upset residents, you know, won't turn sentiment against you, where I know everybody does, you know, no one wants to look tone deaf. But at the same time, we, we're going to have to, to be in the market at a certain point where we're not behind the eight ball. Um, right. So, yeah, I, I think uh, those are the things that I would be looking at. And uh, definitely I'll, I'll be happy to post the things that, that I'm personally paying attention to, all the resources I'm personally paying attention to on the website as well. Great. Great. And, you know, thanks again, Matt, for coming on. And thanks for, for Arrivalist for providing a tool like the Travel Index that allows you to keep your pulse on when things actually are starting to come back. I think that's a super valuable tool. And thanks for all you and Arrivalist are doing in the industry. Well, thank you, Adam. And, and thank you for, for this podcast. And it's such a terrific resource. Uh, I've really enjoyed personally listening to all the interviews. And really, I, I know I speak for a lot of people and I say thank you for the effort that you put into this. It's, it's a terrific resource. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. That's good. And, and we didn't even pay him for that. So that that's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, you know, great, great episode. And everyone, I, I hope you've enjoyed the conversation that Matt and I had today. Thank you for listening. If you're enjoying this, especially the emergency content that we're bringing you uh, through this crisis, please give us a rating or a review uh, on your podcast resource that you're using. Uh, and we'll continue to provide as much or as many resources as we can throughout this crisis to get us all through. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And we'll see you next week.